Hello everybody and welcome back to the Enterprise Dish. We have got yet another uh, another fun episode here. We talked about some Office 365 last week and uh, this week I've got a friend who I've actually known longer than I think just about anybody we've done so far, including Paul Thorat, uh, Mr. Uh, Rick Vanover from Veeam. How's it going, Rick? Hey, Brad. Uh, happy to be here. It's, it's going great. Uh, you got me nice and early. Uh, five, uh, 5.20 a.m. for me in West Coast time. So, uh, you're joining me here in the hotel room, number 320, so uh, happy to join here remotely. <laughs> and before anybody gives me any crap, it was actually Rick's idea to do this time. So this is uh, <laughs> this is early for him, but, you know, here we are. Yeah, what? well, you have to be productive on the road, so uh, I, I was completely available at this time, so that works. Not surprising. What, takes, uh, what brings you to Vegas? Um, it's the large IBM event, IBM Think. Uh, it's around 40,000 people. I believe it's the largest, like what I would call, pure IT event I've ever attended. <laughs> it's a little bit overstimulating. Um, it's, it's, it's legit, too. They, I've actually never had a mainstream IT event catered so good. So, uh, the, you know, the at-venue food is actually pretty good. Interesting. And the, the more interesting thing about that, and I, I don't want to get off on the, on the wrong foot, but a lot of people think of IBM as yesterday, right? And it's because they may not get a lot of same the things as like AWS or Azure, but the fact that 40,000 people are there, uh, and anybody who's kind of been around the block for a little bit, they know that IBM is still very much a big player in this industry. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's a collection of many relatively big companies that make up IBM in a sense. I mean, it's one large corporation, of course, but their services group and they have a whole bunch of new next gen things like Watson and um, the machine learning programs and, and a whole bunch of different things, as well as like uh, established capabilities in the data center, like storage mm -hmm. and things like that, services, uh, applications, you name it, it's, it's got the whole spectrum, and you walk through basically these campuses to, to take in those different experiences. And I, I mean, the other thing I guess that matters is I don't think there's any technology company that's been around as long as IBM. I think they go yeah. back to the 1950s. Yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a I call it semi-famous image of, I think it's a five megabyte hard drive, and it's like 30 guys pulling this thing off the back of a semi, and it, it's you know, it's as big as this desk here. I mean, it's huge, and it's a big IBM, I guess, I, I think it would be a platter at that point. I don't even know if they were at platters yet, uh, but y you are exactly right. And so, as we kick off this portion of the Enterprise Dish, since you weren't here last week, I was going to call you Ducks with Ducks last week. Um, Rick, can you kind of just let people know about your expertise, like what your strengths are, where you, what you do in the industry, and just, to be honest, just kind of who you are? Yeah, sure. So uh, Rick Vanover is the name, and uh, I work at Veeam. I'm the director of product strategy, which is a kind of a loose title in the sense of I really work on a team of evangelists. So we go out to the market. We tell the great Veeam story, and honestly, we, we listen to what changes are happening in the data center and in the cloud space. So uh, we try to match the Veeam capabilities with that, of course. So this is my eighth year at Veeam, and, you know, it's kind of a long time at Veeam because uh, we're a relatively young company in the, in the scheme of things. But um, you know, I've got experience as a blogger mm -hmm. before that. That's how I kind of came on to the, the scene and, and was appropriate for this role at the time. And then um, a lot of experience in enterprise IT as an end user and uh, IT manager, that type of stuff. And you know, got some community cred as well with the Microsoft MVP status, VMware vExpert, and Cisco Champion. So a little bit of everything. <laughs> Yeah, and to be honest, that's one of the reasons why you know we wanted to link up with this is uh, when we do these podcasts, we're not trying to just grab the IT admin that's been in a role for six weeks and is just getting their feet wet. I mean, you've clearly been around the block. You know a lot of different industries um, much more in much more depth than I do, which is excellent because, uh, Rick, I don't know if you saw the news yesterday, but uh, this, this podcast could not have been timed any better. I'm just going to go ahead and give you credit because you picked the day. But um, yesterday, Microsoft announced, uh, what was it, Windows Server 2019. And so for basically anybody on-prem, um, this is massive news. And they said it's going to be coming in the second half of 2018. They didn't give us a firm date, but if I was spitballing it here, uh, they have Ignite in the second half of 2018. And I bet that they're going to probably maybe try to time it up to something like that, because that's a huge 
uh, event for them. So uh, before we dive in with it, did you have any gut reaction to them announcing this? Well, I kind of knew it was coming. First of oh, all, as, well, there you, you go. Know, sure. <laughs> some of us might have. Right. Well, partly partly because of my role as a partner. And, sure. Um, you know, what, what happened in Redmond a couple of weeks ago with, uh, you know, the, the likes of uh, MVP Summit. So that being said, you know, this is not ex- I wouldn't say a surprise, but I, I really want to highlight the one take on this is and that is that I personally think Microsoft is completely embracing the changes going on in IT. So the cloud, next generation apps like containers, they're really mm-hmm. taking this seriously. And, and you actually could see this backwards a little bit with the cadence that's come with like 1709 and, and things like that. So this this cadence is actually showing up in that, I don't know what the right word is. Uh, I want to just say that mainstay, right, for that on-prem sure. OS, that's Windows Server. It's even changing in this regard. So the one thing I'll highlight is this kind of breaks the the, the nomenclature of the number year, right? Because we had uh, 2008 to 12 to 16. We had a nice four-year mm-hmm. split and the R2 cut in between. Well, this is contracting that to basically a three-year split. I mean, just the, the cadence to get stuff out and yep. driven and led, honestly, in the in- industry is led by Microsoft. It's really admirable that they can get these types of things out and available so rapidly. So it's, uh, I mean, as a technologist, I-, I love it. As a partner, I'm ready for it. And if I was an end user, I would uh, really push myself to embrace these new things because this is this is right at the time where people are going to get left behind if they don't if they don't embrace these changes. Yeah, and, and just um, so Microsoft clearly put out a blog post, and I'm very good at reading. Um, one of the things that they they talked about, and this I don't think this comes across too surprising, but I'll be curious if you have any deeper insight. They said Windows Server 2016 is the fastest adopted version of Windows Server ever, which I interpret that to mean that that's obviously people upgrading to 2016. Uh, does, that, does that sound about right? Well, you know, I talk to the full spectrum. I talk yep. to organizations that are uh, shrill, still deploy in 2008, you know, but, um, you know, they're going to be basing that on telemetry data. So mm-hmm. I, I have to defer to them on, on that. You know, you can, the best way to get that is like from Windows Update, right? What is being updated? So you'll know uh, adoption and things like that. But, I do have data, like in the industry, like where where we sit, right at, at Veeam, and mm. I I will say that organizations are moving more towards the progressive adoption of new technologies, specifically around new versions. Okay, so, but there's two things going on here. There's net new stuff that happens in the data center, and then there's also the progressive charge to update. Now, yeah. I, those two separate motions are hard to sort out because it's very possible that a lot of organizations are just adding more stuff. And if they add more stuff, they're adding it on the newer platforms. So I, I caution organizations today to not have too many dinosaurs sitting around in the data center that shrill or are on even mm-hmm. stuff older than 2008, right? Because that's out there too. In fact, uh, I, I hop on a lot of online communities, threads, forums. I see the 2000 word dropped out a couple of times, you know, forget 2003 end of life, but some people are even still running older OSs than that. So I I think there's two sides to that story. That's a little scary. Yeah. (laughs) That's a little scary. Uh, In Microsoft's post, they said that there were four major themes for building out server 2019. They had hybrid security application platform and hybrid converged infrastructure. And we will just kind of run through them here real quickly. On the hybrid side, Microsoft said with Server 19 and Project Honolulu, uh, they they say that customers will be able to easily integrate Azure services such as Azure Backup, File Sync, and Disaster Recovery. Now, Rick, I know you know a lot about Disaster Recovery and Backup. Um, How does this kind of play into your whole narrative? And and what is your take on what Microsoft is doing there? Well, you you have to stretch the platform. And I think that that's exactly what... Honolulu and the like are doing. Uh, I mean, specifically for backup and DR, I mean, I look at what Microsoft is doing is there's always been that native option in the platform. Mm-hmm. I mean, you go all the way back to NT backup. And in fact, you know, might it, it might look at face value like, oh, what's the place for something like Veeam with, you know, that's built into the platform. But 
I have nothing but evidence in the ecosystem that every one of our biggest partners have always had a built-in uh, backup type sure. solution. And it goes, you know, same thing on the VMware side, a lot of the storage partners we deal with. But we've been successful in adding significant capabilities above the, the, the default platform capabilities. So I look at that as, you know, there's, there's the included offering or you can always add more and have additional types of benefits, right? So, you know, from a positioning standpoint, I look at that as, uh, okay, great, it's in the platform, but there's still room for more in the ecosystem. And then the other side of it is when organizations want to move data around, they, they don't always only want to just go to Azure, right? Mm -hmm. There's there's another cloud out there, right? So there's, there's yep. that. And the other side of it is organizations also kind of want one tool for all things. And if you think about that single pane of glass across all backups, DRs, projects, et cetera, there, there's actually a significant case for that. And um, so I think that organizations will, will look into this, but I, I also think that they'll, when they assess their requirements, they'll put themselves in a situation where the requirements will almost dictate what they need to do. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, I, I think it's outstanding that Honolulu is is really stretching the platform and blurring that distinction between on-prem and the, the hyperscale public cloud. And as you pointed out there, and I've actually heard this from, and maybe this is intentionally on the Microsoft side from a lot of partners, that Microsoft is very good at kind of saying, opening the door to the conversation of like saying back up to Azure. Back up to Azure, same thing with Office 365, but they're not very good, and I don't want to put Microsoft in a negative light here, but at making the holistic package, and that's where the Microsoft partner ecosystem, such as yourself, such as other people we, we bring on here, really kind of fill in that whole narrative. Is that? Do you tend to agree with that, disagree? Well, absolutely. It's it's really a, a, the result of what, what I would call the shared responsibility model, mm -hmm. and depending on the services you use, there's this magical line where... The, the infrastructure, the apps, the availability of that is that of the platform. And then the responsibility of the data resides with the, the owners of it. Right? Yeah. So that's actually one of our biggest educational opportunities for the Office 365 backup product that we have. Is that it's your data mm -hmm. and ultimately organizations need to steward that. Right. So that that is absolutely central to what we uh have to educate the market. And it's really the same thing a couple years ago when we were talking about virtualization. It's like, oh, well, I've stacked all my computers on one and the hypervisor can just take care of all the backup. I'm like, yes, but it might not go the way you think, right? There's no yeah. full, full inclusion of the responsibility. In fact, if anything, you have emphasized responsibility because you have more concentrated uh, risk points of sorts. So uh, this is just another educational opportunity that we're taking to market. In fact, I had a funny call yesterday with someone who really trying to uh, aggressively get me to get the, that message about that shared responsibility model mm -hmm. out. And the same thing happens in other clouds. I mean, it's definitely present with the SaaS space with Office 365 and the Azure space. But if you look at all the other hyperscale public clouds, it's it that phenomena exists consistently across it. Yep. One of the things, and I think you're hitting on this exactly, one of the things I hear over and over again, especially from people helping people migrate to the cloud, is that you never want to be in a situation where you're telling your boss you're sitting there waiting on Microsoft to give you all your data back. And that you need to have a, a scenario that if you know you can't connect to Microsoft, things happen. Microsoft makes a lot of good SLA guarantees. They have redundant data centers. But... If something happens to them and not, your business is impacted, you need to be able to self-recover um, to at least some capacity so you, obviously you're not totally offline. Well, absolutely. And, and this is an example that applies more to Office 365, but you could take it in the Azure case as well. But we actually tell people that, hey, if you are a business that has a requirement that you need to retain your email forever, and mm -hmm. there are some of those that have that, you will be hard-pressed to do that on the native platform. So... We actually educate a lot around how they can still do that or even have a hybrid deployment, which is actually more common. Some on-prem exchange, some Office 365 email. So when you really look at how organizations are using these platforms and what their requirements are, you kind of back into the need of managing that data a lot mm -hmm. more than what people think. 
Very, very interesting. It's something to always, always to be considerate of. Uh, moving on to the second pillar that they talked about, security, which is obviously always going to be an evergreen topic no matter what you talk about in the enterprise world. Uh, for the security side, they said, and, and again, if this is of interest to you, I fully recommend you doing a deep dive into the content that was announced. But some of the highlights were uh, with Server 19, shielded VMs will now support Linux. Um, they're adding encryption, encrypted networks to let admins encrypt uh, network segments. And they're also embedding Windows Defender Advanced Threat Protection into Server 19. Um, I think if you, uh, I kind of have an ongoing joke that if you can make a case for a software as a service or embedding advanced threat protection, you will get a promotion inside the world of Microsoft. Well, I think those are actually critical moves. And the one mm -hmm. that I'll highlight is the Defender Advanced Threat Detection. Th that is actually a pretty good platform. For, for the case, right? Uh, I don't want to just call it just antivirus, but it's actually pretty good. And a lot of people, I think a lot of organizations kind of dismiss some of the uh, native things. But I have, again, nothing but evidence that Microsoft's native capabilities in some areas are doing really good, like what they've done for storage uh, with the ReFS file system and Storage Spaces Direct and things like that have been really good momentums uh, and, and capabilities that they've delivered. But then this Windows Defender capability, I actually think that's that's really good. So I think that having that as you look both on-prem and what you might do in the cloud, it becomes really a table stake because you have to take this security design um, a lot more seriously today. Everything from ransomware to uh, honestly just, you know, the rules of your data. And what I mean by that is even though the platform may have changed, you know, the advent of the hyperscale mm -hmm. public cloud and SaaS offerings, but organizations don't really have, the, their rules haven't changed, right? How, what they do with their data and th that hasn't gone away just because the platform's changed. So yep. I think that organizations need to take that security and, and these types of things that you mentioned, uh, they need to take that very seriously today. Yep, there's no other way to describe it because if once your data is breached, um, nobody really wants to have to go to PR and say like, "Hey, we need you to write up a press release that we lost." Um, but just like wasn't it, it was one of the travel sites? Um, the past 24 hours said um, 800,000 credit cards were stolen, and so um, yeah, you, well, you don't want to. Yeah, you don't want to. You don't want to be in that in that that space. And actually, what I tell people is, you can pay now or pay later. So you would pay later and mm -hmm. asking that that press release to be made or asking your boss for more money to get you out of an incredibly bad situation, or you pay now and invest in training or invest in designs and architectures that'll put you in a resilient position against those types of threats, right? So that's my advice. Invest now, learn now, architect now, so that you don't have those those issues later. Yeah, no, that, that's pretty sound advice. Pay now or pay later. That should be a bumper sticker that VM hands out. <laughs> <laughs> no, because then they're going to think, well, then, well, does that mean I can pay half now and yeah. pay half later for Veeam <laughs> or something like that? No, that just, that would not translate well to my sales team, that's for sure. 50% down now, 50% later. No, it doesn't quite work that way. Doesn't well, quite I got work. a coupon, Brad. You, what can you do for me, you know? And then, <laughs> then it's just, it just derails badly from that. <laughs> and now you know why I'm not in enterprise sales. <laughs> Uh, the other, other well, there's two more big things. The application platform, Microsoft says that uh, in Windows Server 2019, their goal is to reduce server core base image to a third of its current size of five gigabytes. Do you, any idea how they're doing that? Well, how they're doing it, no, but why they're doing it is, is more important as I take a selfie here. Or, well, I'm just taking a selfie of me. Maybe I got to get you to say something. But uh, the why they're doing it really is feedback. I think that... Uh, you know, the, the scale of the deployments, the, the download times, the deployment times, those are, I guess, points of feedback. But I will say, by the way, that storage isn't usually a problem. Mm -hmm. It's That's not the bottleneck in data centers and clouds today. It's, you know, it's time, it's performance, uh, maybe memory. But, I mean, I appreciate the efficiency, but it's not usually an issue, but it is a feedback point. But I don't usually complain about the size of image because I love the capability where I can do anything with that image, right? So sure. I, I'm not super progressive on core myself, but I know a lot of orgs that are, so they would appreciate that. But it, it really is driven from feedback above all else, I think. 
Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, one other main point here, and actually, I want to ask you to clarify what it is first before we dive in. So hyperconverged infrastructure is a term that gets tossed around a lot. Can you just define what that is? Well, honestly, the, the bad thing about hyperconverged, in my opinion, is it really uh, depends on the implementation. There's a lot of, in my opinion, there's mm -hmm. a lot of fragmentation in the space. So, you know, the, the Microsoft approach is, is pretty agnostic. I okay. don't want to say it's completely bring your own uh, compute resources and storage resources to it. But they're... There is they, they they're putting some structure around it, and in particular the I believe it's called the the Windows Software Defined Program, mm -hmm. Windows Server Software Defined Program, where they're trying to give you like a recipe to indicate how your experience will be. But I've seen a lot of things happen in this HCI space. On the like the I guess a lot of times people say HCI, and there's a couple of brands that come to mind like like Nutanix or SimpliVity and things like that. And and the thing is, those are so different across each other. And then and then you look at what main, main line, lack of a better word, uh, technology brands are doing, like Microsoft and, and others. And the, the result is what matters is the software, is a, what, what is happening, in my opinion. And you've actually seen some of the earlier uh, HCI players actually transitioning to more of a software only deliverable okay uh, the hardware always matters in the end but people go to hyperconverge for the benefit of scale out capabilities and um, you know somewhat lower hardware costs because of advanced software but what I'm getting at here is that it's it's kind of a cloud model right there's a there's a guy I know that fundamentally changed how I think about cloud and, and he had actually gone in to say that cloud is not a location it's a model it's a model of doing the business where it's elastic scale and consumption billing etc cetera, etc cetera. i'd actually argue that hci is a little bit like that as well it's not hardware it's a model it's of scale out and, and things like that so uh i don't think we're done in the hci space but i do see a lot of different use cases on primary compute, on, on secondary backup storages, uh, software-only approaches. But my observation, and I'm being a little bit of an analyst, I guess, at this moment, is that we haven't seen like one vendor in all of the HCI space clearly come and lead the pack from the list of established like top five or ten mm -hmm. hardware or software companies out there. I've not seen a a Dell, a, a IBM, or a Microsoft, or a uh, or a VMware, or uh, or whatever come out. Now VMware has a storage implementation that's a pretty good bet on technology with their vSAN technology, but we can do something like that with storage spaces too. So all of that being said, this is a market that's not done, but there's an incredible amount of potential for it, and I, I challenge it's a model of doing IT that will stick. And it's going to be powered by software. So putting all that together, Microsoft's a very safe bet in the long run on that. No, that's actually, and this is one of the reasons why I love to have you here is because you, again, uh, you know this industry backwards and forwards and you can provide that. That's pretty genuine insight right there into that whole market. Yeah, yeah it is somewhat backwards. You have to work backwards, I think, to get to the result because you got to ask yourself, why do people do that? Why would people go to a new platform like HCI or why would people go to the cloud? And you always start with the why, and you kind of then work yourself into the, the how, honestly. So that's a piece of life advice, I guess, above all. It's like, <laughs> how do I get to the cloud? Well, sure. or how do I modernize my data center? Think about why you want to do it, and then the how comes easy. Now, that's really, really good stuff. Uh, for any entry-level IT pro who's listening, um, you know, Rick is a, a top resource uh, and mind in, in the industry. And I'm not just saying that because... Um, He's here on a podcast with me, but I've known Rick, we'll just ballpark it, eight to ten years somewhere in that area, I think, at this point. Yeah, I think it was 2008 or 2009 we met uh, in Texas the first time. And yep. it, it, funny thing is, for the listeners, you know, we're, we live uh, in the same state, even yep. though I'm out of state right now. But uh, no, 
Every time he's in town, I, I buy him good potatoes for breakfast. I, I was going to bring that up. The best <laughs> breakfast potatoes, was it called? North Star Cafe? Is that what it was? Yeah. Yeah. North Star Cafe in Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. yeah. It's good stuff. Um, if you ever end up in that area, do yourself a favor. Go there and get not one, but two orders of the breakfast potatoes because <laughs> they are, <laughs> they were, um, they were amazing. Yeah. I love that place. It's, uh, I, I'm a little bit of a foodie. There's three things I know. I know travel and airplanes. I know computers and I know food. And that one's on my approved list of the food category for sure. It's good to know. This is actually a, a perfect segue here. Um, first time listeners and people who listen to the first episode, but know at the end, we always give the guest in this case, Rick, a little chance to dish and it can be on anything from the cell phone he's using, uh, to travel, which he knows, but as Rick has just stated, he's a little bit of a foodie. So Rick, um, this is your time to shine and just share to the world. your either tips for cooking or whatever you got on your mind. Well, yeah, I do like to cook. Uh, a lot of people know me for that. In fact, on Instagram, I run a private, nothing like super fancy, but I run the uh, Cucina Ricatron hashtag. Anytime I cook something of interest, I share it out there. And uh, basically, I got into making my own spices, right? So wow. I'll, I'll back. I'll go backwards a little bit. About the same time I first met you, Brad, I, I went to New Mexico for a vacation, and I saw this guy on the back of a pickup truck. So let me say it was in, I think it was Chimayo, New Mexico, so north of Santa Fe. That's a very good food part of the country, by the way, uh, New Mexico is. And this guy was sitting on the back of his pickup truck selling chili peppers. I'm like, what? It must be good. <laughs> or it's a little dodgy. It was either really sketch or it was really good. It was yep, no middle. Yep. Okay. So I went to the guy and... I bought these, I took, you know, opened the bag, took a whiff. Whoa, it was so good. It was so smelled amazing. And then I asked him, what do I do with them? All right. And then he told me, well, get you a spice grinder. And he put me on a path. And so I started making my own chili powder. And hmm. wow, it is amazing. So everything from ancho, guajillo chilies, these are dried. Or that, in that case, it was New Mexico hatch chilies. It changed my life. Right. And I started making my own Indian food with Indian spices, like all 25 ingredients. And oh, wow. Yeah, I make spice rubs for like smoked meats and stuff like that. So I'm really getting ready for barbecue season uh, this year uh, in Ohio. But as you tell me, we got some snow, so I might have to wait a couple more weeks. <laughs> yeah, a big thumbs down. I golfed on Monday afternoon. And if I went to that same golf course, it would be covered in about four inches of snow right now. I don't know if Columbus got it as bad as Cincinnati, but it doesn't matter. It's technically spring and it's snowing. Yeah, we got, uh, I was tracking the weather at home. They got a little bit of it, but I'm supposed to fly to New York today for Tech Unplugged. Sorry, yeah, yeah Tech Unplugged. Uh, but I am giving it like 10% chance that I'm actually going to make it to New York tonight. Yeah, I, I, I'm I generally an optimist in my life, but... Um... Yeah. <laughs> I, not, not, not seeing it. <laughs> no, especially knowing, um, knowing how Delta, I, I, assuming you're flying Delta. Oh, diehard Delta. Yes. Yeah, same. I mean, I, I knew you fly Delta. I fly Delta all the time. And, and knowing Delta, they're actually really good um, about canceling flights ahead of time. Actually, we had it, – it was it was very tragic, Rick. We were in Hawaii, and uh, they, they called us three hours before we were supposed to leave and said, hey, your flight to Atlanta is canceled. We got you on another flight, but you're, you're, you're going to have to stay in Hawaii another 12 hours on the beach. It was it was very tragic, but fortunately we didn't get to the airport. We were still at our hotel, and life was you know I was like ah fine, go back to the hotel room and go back out yeah. on the beach until 10 p.m. instead of 10 a.m. Um, but yeah, so I wish you the best of luck with that. No, you know, and to to be fair, that that airlines never let me down, mm. and that's you know everybody has their choice, and it's always based on kind of where you're starting from, what your options are there, or also yep. where you're going to. And they've never let me down, so uh, yeah, I, I'm not worried about it. Uh, but I'm not quite at the beach, but yeah. uh, they, they take good care of me. Well, Rick, as we wrap it up here, if anybody has any questions, or what's the best way to kind of find you out in the world? Oh, Twitter. Uh, I love that Twitter stuff. Yep. At Rick Vanover is an easy way to find me. Uh, I'm arguably one of the most easy people to find on the internet. I put my I put my Google Voice number on my blog. You know, I don't care. Call me too, whatever you want. But uh, at Rick Vanover is a great starting place. And then uh, you know, Rick dot Rick dot Vanover at Veeam dot com for those you know afraid to go do the tweet thing. 
Yep, nope, totally understandable. Well, that wraps it up for today, folks. We very much appreciate Rick stopping by, dropping his knowledge bombs all over us, and he will be back, uh, I think, every every month you're going to be coming back here, Rick. So this is just the start of something great. And uh, as always, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe. You can find us on iTunes and Google Play now. And uh, we'll be back again here in the near future. And uh, have yourselves a rest, uh, I was going to say a rest of the month, but <laughs> rest of the week. And we'll catch you right back here next time on the Enterprise Dish.